Now, this international best-selling novelist has written the book of two ways. You might think ancient Egypt is all pyramids, sphinxes, but this book goes so much deeper than that. The reason it's famous is because it's the first map we have of the afterlife. It was usually found on the bottom of the coffin under the mummy, and there were two paths, a blue one and a black one. One was water and one was land. In ancient Egypt, the concept of death was not viewed as an escape from suffering. Instead, even in the afterlife, hundreds of dangers awaited, turning the journey into a horrifying spiritual course. The ultimate destination was Aru, a fearsome realm ruled by Osiris, the god of death. To reach this desired place, the departed had to navigate at least two challenging routes, each requiring guidance from a special handbook known as the Book of Two Ways. Recently, archaeologists made a shocking discovery, a copy of this ancient guidebook that dates back 4,000 years. What shocking message does this book carry, and what does it mean for Egyptian scholars? Join us as we unravel the terrifying message revealed in this ancient book found in Egypt, The Legend of Osiris. Osiris, a prominent figure in Egyptian mythology, was initially revered as a formidable god during the 5th dynasty. Over time, his image evolved into that of a kind deity, often depicted as a green or black-skinned man with a pharaoh's beard tightly wrapped in mummy linen. He adorned a distinctive wreath called the Atef, featuring a tall conical white crown from Lower Egypt, framed by long plumes of ram's horns. The color of Osiris's skin symbolized not only the decomposition of the corpse, but also the awakening of new vegetation on fertile ground. In Egyptian mythology, Osiris ascended to rule Egypt after his father, becoming one of the most revered deities in the Egyptian pantheon. According to the myths, Osiris, born in the necropolis known as the Underworld Gate of Memphis, played a vital role in teaching early Egyptians essential life skills, agriculture, and tool usage. His reign came to a tragic end when his violent brother Seth sought the throne, leading to Osiris's murder. The myth unfolds as Seth tricks Osiris into entering a coffin, sealing it with molten lead, and tossing it into the Nile. The coffin eventually washes ashore in Byblos, Lebanon, encased in a tree trunk that becomes a palace pillar. Isis, Osiris's wife and sister, searches for and reassembles his dismembered body with the assistance of Anubis, the god of the underworld. Anubis helps create the first mummy, allowing Isis to breathe life into Osiris's body. In a transformative act, Isis takes the form of a bird and hovers over Osiris's mummy, leading to their union and the conception of their son, Horus the Younger. Born in the wake of Osiris's resurrection, Horus emerged as a powerful symbol of fresh starts and the triumphant conqueror who defeated the usurper, Seth. Engaging in a fierce battle, Horus faced off against Seth for control of Egypt's throne and emerged victorious. This victory established a crucial connection between Horus and the concept of kingship among the Egyptians. This complex tale weaves together themes of death, resurrection, and the eternal cycle of life, contributing to the enduring legacy of Osiris in ancient Egyptian mythology. Journey to the Afterlife in ancient Egypt, the early kings were seen as the living embodiment of Horus, but it was believed that upon their death, they transformed into Osiris. Osiris, designated as the Lord of the Underworld by Anubis, took on the role of a mummified king, holding the crook and flail symbolizing his roles as the shepherd god and a divine authority. His emblem, the Jed Pillar, was considered the backbone of Osiris, representing stability in the underworld in Egyptian mythology. Following his death and resurrection, Osiris became linked to natural cycles, including the ebb and flow of the Nile River and the yearly growth and death of crops along the Nile Valley. Consequently, he gained recognition as the god of agriculture and fertility, embodying the cycles of nature. Worshipped as the grain god, Osiris was revered through a sack filled with seeds that sprouted greenery. Festivals featured women parading models with extended parts, symbolizing the god's manliness. The germinating seed symbolized Osiris's rebirth, exemplified by a near-holy discovery in Tutankhamun's tomb. 
the Egyptian concept of the underworld depicted it as a narrow valley with a river, separated from the living world by a mountain range where the sun rose and set. Deceased souls navigated perilous paths, guided by a god with a dog's head, ultimately facing judgment in the Hall of the Two Truths. Anubis led the dead through this judgment, weighing their hearts against the feather of truth. Those whose hearts balanced with the feather entered into Osiris's service for an eternal and joyful afterlife. However, those with heavier hearts, filled with shame and sins, faced the soul-eating demon, a meat, leading to the denial of eternal life. Such individuals endured terrifying punishment and a second death, from which there was no return. This intricate Egyptian belief system sheds light on the profound journey from life to the afterlife, weaving together elements of mythology, morality, and the eternal fate of the departed. The terrifying portrayals of punishment in ancient Egyptian beliefs might have influenced how ancient people envisioned the torturous existence in hell. Early Christian texts, outlining the process of purification for the justified, drew inspiration from certain grand scripts. Within these narratives, the departed undergo a triumphant journey over evil, leading to a rebirth. Contrary to the fate of the condemned who face complete annihilation into a state of non-being, there is no hint of eternal torment. The myth of Osiris, covering his death, mummification, and resurrection, offered the Egyptians a ray of hope for life beyond death. In the realm of Osiris, a kingdom unfolded, promising a continuation of existence after the mortal coil was shed. The intriguing discovery of the Book of Two Ways. Recently, a shocking discovery has been unveiled in the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology, thrusting the timeline of ancient literature further into the past. The findings not only shed light on the rich historical background, but also reveal the unwavering dedication and creative problem-solving skills of the ancients as they grappled with the puzzle of mortality. Rita Lucarelli, an Egyptology curator at the University of California, Berkeley, shared her insights in an interview, describing how the ancient Egyptians were consumed by an intense fascination with all aspects of life. For them, death marked the beginning of a new and profound existence. At the heart of this remarkable revelation lies the Book of Two Ways, and the most recent finding stands as the eldest among the approximately 20 existing copies. Colin Barris, in his exploration for New Scientist, intricately unfolds how this ancient manuscript predates its forerunner by roughly 40 years. The secret location of this invaluable artifact, concealed from both tomb raiders and previous archaeologists, was accidentally discovered during the excavation of a burial pit in the Egyptian village of Dair al-Barsh. Unlike modern bound books, this ancient text was part of a larger collection, with inscriptions directly on the interior of the coffin preserved on two rotting cedar panels, adorned with images and hieroglyphs. These inscriptions refer directly to the Book of Two Ways, dating back to the reign of Pharaoh Mentuhotep II, who ruled until 2010 BC. Following the tumultuous days of the War Cemetery, King Mentuhotep II strategically expanded his kingdom into northern Nubia, situated to the south, with the aim of solidifying the unification of Egypt. In a wise move, Mentuhotep garnered the submission of the northern nomarchs, opting to retain most of them in their positions to facilitate the process of reunification. This diplomatic maneuver not only helped in reuniting the fragmented regions, but also laid the foundation for a network of influential provincial families. As he passed away, he left behind a kingdom that was not only reunified, but also flourishing. His successor, Sakari Mentuhotep III, inherited this legacy and would go on to become the second king of Egypt's Middle Kingdom. This transition marked a pivotal moment in the historical tapestry of ancient Egypt, paving the way for the continued prosperity and cultural development of the region. Harko Williams, the study's author and an Egyptologist at the University of Leuven in Belgium, explained in an interview that these coffin texts aimed to position the deceased within the realm of the gods. The sarcophagus belonged to Ankh, a high-status woman, although her afterlife instructions peculiarly identified her as he. Kara Cooney, an expert on Egyptian art and architecture at the University of California, Los Angeles, 
clarified that this practice stemmed from the association of rebirth with male gods in ancient Egypt. A fascinating element within Ankh's Book of Two Ways alludes to a possible hurdle in the form of a ring of fire during her afterlife journey. This poetic detail implies that she might have encountered trials, engaging in battles against bitter spirits, demons, and earthly perils like fire in the latter phases of her journey beyond life. The distinctive details woven into Ankh's narrative contribute an additional layer of mystery enhancing the fascination surrounding the ancient wisdom preserved within this recently discovered literary gem. The sole defense against these disasters lay in the enchantments cast by Ankh, who had passed away. Fortunately, the accompanying materials included elaborate instructions on how to perform these mystical incantations. The maps within this book, along with others of its kind, present a bewildering array of intricate lines and enigmatic figures, symbols that remain indecipherable in the present era. Some experts posit that these depictions originated from scenes of life rather than death, intending to evoke rituals meant to resurrect gods or deceased individuals. Regardless, the texts conveyed a theme of rebirth, whether in the realm we know or another mysterious world. Most historians agree that the earliest forms of writing emerged around 5,000 years ago. Recent discoveries of numerous remarkable books have allowed us to piece together glimpses of life from thousands of years ago. These written accounts span a wide array of topics, but it's the ones shrouded in mystery that truly capture our curiosity. These discoveries mirror the vivid depictions found in the Book of the Dead, offering a captivating glimpse into the life of an ancient Egyptian. Annie's Book of the Dead in a captivating depiction, Annie stands resolutely before an expansive and ornate golden scale, a mysterious tableau portraying the jackal-headed god Anubis meticulously balancing the intrinsic essence of his heart against the sublime purity of a feather from an ostrich. This artistic tableau is not merely an imaginative construct, but a vivid representation extracted from Annie's Book of the Dead a prodigious 78-foot papyrus scroll that functioned as both a spiritual guide and a metaphysical roadmap, tailored to aid him in his quest for transcendence and eternal existence. Ani, a real historical figure and a well-educated scribe hailing from the venerable Egyptian city of Thebes during the bygone 13th century BCE, becomes the protagonist in his own afterlife journey. The Book of the Dead, often associated with the elite ranks, such as pharaohs, transforms into a powerful conduit for regular individuals like Ani, suggesting that the aspirations for the afterlife were not limited to the aristocracy, but extended to those with a fervent desire for spiritual continuity. The complex process of mummification spanned 70 days and involved skilled priests who served as embalmers. These priests possessed not only the knowledge of precise rituals and prayers, but also an intricate understanding of human anatomy. The initial step involved carefully extracting internal organs prone to rapid decay. The brain, considered a challenging task, was gently removed through the nostrils with specialized instruments. To prevent disfigurement, the utmost care was taken. Following this, the embalmers proceeded to remove organs from the abdomen and chest through a carefully crafted incision, usually on the left side. The heart, revered as the core of a person's being and intelligence, remained untouched. Other organs, including the stomach, liver, lungs, and intestines, were cautiously preserved in separate containers known as canopic jars. These jars, housing the organs, were then interred with the mummy. In later practices, organs were treated, wrapped, and reinserted into the body, but the tradition of including canopic jars persisted. The next phase involved extracting all moisture from the body, a process achieved by covering the body with natron, a special salt. Additional natron packets were strategically placed inside the body. Once the body achieved complete desiccation, the internal packets were removed, and a gentle washing eliminated the residual natron. The outcome was a remarkably desiccated yet recognizable human form. To enhance the lifelike appearance, sunken areas of the body were filled with materials like linen and artificial eyes were incorporated into the mummy. After the meticulous mummification process, the intricate art of wrapping unfolded. 
This stage demanded an extensive quantity of linen measured in hundreds of yards for each mummy. With utmost precision, the priests embarked on the task of winding long strips of linen around the body. Their attention to detail extended to wrapping each finger and toe individually before enveloping the entire hand or foot in linen, creating a cocoon-like covering that embraced the entire mummified form. The precision in the wrapping process showcased the reverence and care dedicated to preserving the sanctity of the deceased. Protective charms and a heart scarab amulet, chosen with foresight, embellish the wrappings, aiming to serve crucial roles in the soul's posthumous journey. This meticulous two-month-long transformation seeks not only to arrest the decaying grasp of time upon Ani's corporeal form, but more importantly, to establish a preserved and idealized vessel wherein his spirit can potentially reunite in an ethereal dance with perpetuity. Yet this reunion is accidental upon the spirit's successful journey through the Duat, the dangerous and shadowy underworld. An ancient realm unfolds, replete with vast caverns, lakes of searing fire, and mysterious gates. All vigilantly guarded by mythic creatures, including serpentine beings, crocodiles, and monstrous entities, whose designations strike fear into the hearts of the living. Within this harrowing landscape, Apep, the ominous serpent deity of destruction, assumes a graceful role, waiting in the shadows to engulf Ani's soul in a transformational swirl of senselessness. Navigating the Afterlife Armed with the metaphysical arsenal carefully inscribed within his personalized Book of the Dead, Ani navigates this spectral terrain. Customized with an array of spells, prayers, and esoteric codes, this ancient text transforms into a metaphysical compass guiding Ani's elegant voyage. As the main character overcomes formidable obstacles, repels the horrific creatures of the underworld, and maneuvers stealthily past the ominous presence of Apep, a climactic destination materializes, the Hall of Ma'at. In this celestial juncture, presided over by Ma'at, the goddess symbolic of truth and justice, Ani faces the ultimate court of judgment, 42 assessor gods, vigilant and discerning, become the determiners of his posthumous fate. Ani, having journeyed through realms of peril and challenges, now stands before the metaphysical inquisition, striving to convince the divine pantheon of the righteousness inherent in the life he once led. This complex story of myth and spirituality, woven within the Book of the Dead, embodies the terrifying beliefs and aspirations of an ancient civilization, portraying the profound complexities of the human psyche in its perpetual quest for excellence and continuity beyond mortal bounds. In an entrancing portrayal of divine judgment, Ani, a respected scribe from the venerable city of Thebes in the 13th century BCE, stands before a celestial court. The mythical tableau unfolds with Ani meticulously addressing each deity by name, invoking the sacred practice of negative confessions, declarations of innocence and denial of sins committed in the earthly realm. Amidst these denials, Ani exclaims his abstention from actions such as inducing tears, eavesdropping, and contributing to water pollution. Yet, the confusion between these claims and the realities of Ani's human existence unveils the occultic role of the heart scarab amulet. This magical talisman, inscribed with the potent command, do not stand as a witness against me, assumes the profound responsibility of safeguarding Ani's heart from bearing witness to the transgressions of his earthly sojourn. It becomes the theoretical shield against the recounting of moments when Ani, as a mortal, secretly listened to the disputes of his neighbors or bathed his feet in the sacred waters of the Nile. The apex of Ani's ethereal odyssey climaxes in the grand theater of celestial justice, the delicate weighing of his heart against the pure ostrich feather. This symbolic act, conducted by the jackal-headed god Anubis, unfolds with profound consequences. Should Ani's heart prove heavier, laden with the weight of misdeeds, the monstrous Amet, a creature amalgamated from crocodile, 
leopard, and hippopotamus elements, awaits to devour it. This ominous fate signifies eternal obliteration for Ani. However, the cosmic scales tip in Ani's favor, affirming the purity of his heart. Xel, radiant Ra, the sun god, takes Ani under his divine protection, guiding him to Osiris, the venerable god of the underworld. In the hallowed presence of Osiris, Ani receives the ultimate approval to traverse into the afterlife, a paradisiacal expanse of endless reeds. Here, the spectral curtain unfolds, painting a paradise free of sorrow, anguish, and resentment. Yet, it is a realm not bereft of purpose, as Ani, in agreement with his heavenly brothers, engages in the sublime cultivation of a celestial plot, aided by a Shabti doll enshrined within his tomb. The supernatural climax of Ani's otherworldly journey finds actual permanence in the papyrus of Ani, a revered manuscript protected within the esteemed confines of the British Museum since 1888. Within its illuminated pages, the mystique of Ani's posthumous sojourn takes shape, a realm of perpetual serenity where he finds eternal solace in the harmonious cultivation of celestial crops. The Book of the Dead, a profound artifact, serves as a portal to the cosmic aspirations and mystical beliefs that guided Ani's odyssey beyond the mortal veil. Maat, a symbol of order. The concept of Maat was highly esteemed in ancient Egyptian society, representing truth, justice, balance, and cosmic order. The people of Kemet valued Maat, viewing her as an abstract goddess with great symbolic significance. This goddess symbolized order on personal, social, and cosmic levels, playing a crucial role in the Egyptian understanding of kingship. Depicted as a woman with an ostrich plume on her head or by an ostrich feather alone, Maat was associated with creator deities and considered the beloved daughter of the sun god Ra. From the 14th century BCE onward, she was often shown with outstretched wings. Much like the goddess Isis, Maat was believed to have the power to revive the dead with the air generated by her wings. The feather of Maat became a symbol of balance, order, truth, and justice, eventually becoming the hieroglyph sign for these concepts. Another emblem associated with Maat was a plinth sign, representing her as the foundation of the universe. This visual representation suggested that the goddess was the base upon which Egyptian society and order were built. The cult of Maat was deeply ingrained in Egyptian society, regulating the relationship between the pharaoh and the people. Rituals and offerings were performed to honor Maat, and judges and high court officials wore golden images of the goddess to signify the enforcement of her laws. Crimes against Maat, such as jealousy, gluttony, laziness, injustice, and ungratefulness were considered serious offenses. The dead-faced judgment in the Hall of Osiris, with their hearts weighed against the feather of Maat. If the heart was lighter or balanced, the soul was deemed true of voice, or justified and allowed to proceed to the afterlife. Maat personified the harmonious laws of cosmic order and played a vital role in Egyptian cosmology and ethics. She represented a balance between gods and people, genders, and maintained order in daily life. As a symbol of order, Maat was associated with the daily regeneration of the sun and played a crucial role in the final judgment of souls in the afterlife. While Maat's prominence declined in the Greco-Roman period, her influence persisted throughout ancient Egyptian history, shaping ethical and moral principles. The goddess symbolized the conscience of individuals, guiding them to act honorably and sincerely in their interactions with others. In Egypt, a fascinating discovery has reportedly been made, a mysterious book that appears to be thousands of years old, inscribed in a language that has left the finders baffled, unable to unravel its secrets. The individuals who stumbled upon this enigmatic book took to social media, sharing captivating photos, and expressed a hopeful desire that someone proficient in ancient languages might come forward to decode its contents and unveil its historical significance. In what language is the mysterious book written? What is its content? Come along as we unravel the content of this mysterious book.
Journey of an Ancient Manuscript. The origin of this intriguing book traces back to the Giza Plateau, where a local tour guide claims to have unearthed it. The guide not only encountered the book, but also had the privilege of handling it, capturing photographs to document this extraordinary find. The guide's current location remains unknown, raising speculation that the ancient manuscript might have entered the secret realms of the black market, a customary fate for such remarkable discoveries. Some enthusiasts speculate about the potential spiritual nature of the book, suggesting that its ancient language could serve as a secret means of communication with higher powers. This intriguing possibility adds another layer of mystery to the riddle surrounding this ancient text, leaving both scholars and the curious alike eager to unveil the secrets concealed within its pages. The ancient civilization of Egypt stands as one of the earliest and most remarkable chapters in the story of humanity. Among the many accomplishments of the ancient Egyptians, their impact on art, medicine, and the captivating recording of their findings are particularly noteworthy. The ancient Egyptians have left an enduring legacy through their artistic expressions, showcasing an extraordinary blend of anatomy and mythology in their symbolic figures. Their mastery in intertwining the complexity of the human body with the rich fable of mythological tales has set them apart as true pioneers in the world of artistic representation. Notably, the Egyptians didn't merely create art for its aesthetic appeal, they aptly merged their understanding of anatomy with mythological narratives, creating a visual language that transcended time. Through their artistic prowess, they communicated profound ideas, contributing not only to the visual arts, but also to the broader understanding of the human experience. In essence, the ancient Egyptians' fusion of art, anatomy, and mythology is a testament to their unparalleled creativity and intellectual prowess making them pioneers in the annals of human civilization. Ancient Egypt boasts an incredibly famous set of myths centered around the characters Isis, Osiris, and Horus. These captivating tales have been passed down through generations, weaving a rich tale of gods, goddesses, and divine intrigue. At the heart of this mythology is the story of Isis, the devoted wife, and Osiris, a feared and respected ruler. Their narrative takes an unexpected turn with Osiris facing betrayal and demise, only to be resurrected through the magical efforts of Isis. The legacy continues with the birth of Horus, their son, who plays a significant role in the mythological pantheon. This fascinating tale goes beyond mere storytelling. It reflects the ancient Egyptians' beliefs, values, and deep connection with the divine. The minute details of these myths add layers of fascination to our understanding of the cultural and spiritual drama that defined life in ancient Egypt. Derived from the ancient narrative of Isis and Osiris, the Eye of Horus holds a significant role as a symbol denoting both prosperity and protection. This ancient emblem is not just a mere representation. It carries with it a profound tale of resurrection, healing, and safeguarding. Horus's mystical eye is more than just a symbol on ancient artifacts. Envision it as a powerful amulet, believed by the ancient Egyptians to bring forth prosperity and ward off harm. Its intricate design embodies the essence of the enduring myth, creating a tangible link between the people and the divine forces they revered. In delving into the symbolism of the Eye of Horus, we uncover not only a representation of an ancient tale, but a timeless emblem that transcends its origins. Its significance stretches beyond the realms of myth, transforming into a cultural icon that speaks to the human desire for well-being and protection throughout the ages. Eye of Horus, a symbol of protection. The Eye of Horus, also known as the Wajet or Ujat, is a captivating and ancient Egyptian symbol that has fascinated people worldwide. This iconic emblem is closely tied to protection, healing, and the power of regeneration, holding a significant place in the mythology, religion, and culture of ancient Egypt. According to Egyptian legend, the Eye of Horus represents the eye that Horus, the son of Osiris and Isis, lost in a battle against Set, the god of chaos and violence. 
Set, portrayed as a man with the head of a jackal-like creature and fiery red hair, commits a nefarious act by killing Osiris and scattering his body. Seizing the throne of the gods for himself, Set's reign is later challenged by Horus, Osiris's son, who valiantly restores order to the world. The eye was later restored to Horus, becoming a symbol associated with the power of resurrection and regeneration. This story emphasizes the importance of the Eye of Horus as a symbol of renewal and restoration. Beyond its religious significance, the Eye of Horus served as a measuring tool in ancient Egyptian mathematics. Each of its six parts represented a specific fraction, symbolizing the concept of wholeness. This captivating image comes to life when superimposed onto a side view of the human brain, revealing a mysterious connection between each part of the picture and a specific region responsible for our senses. The eyebrow represented thought, the pupil represented sight, the iris represented knowledge, the teardrop represented sacrifice, and the two markings at the corner of the eye represented life and health. Together, these parts created a powerful symbol of protection and healing. The Eye of Horus wasn't limited to symbolism, it was incorporated into amulets, jewelry, and various objects to provide protection and healing. These amulets were particularly popular in funerary rites, believed to safeguard the deceased on their journey to the afterlife. Believed to have healing properties, especially for vision, the Eye of Horus was used in treating various ailments. Its association with the sun, considered a source of healing and vitality, may have contributed to these perceived healing properties. Beyond protection and healing, the Eye of Horus was associated with the concept of Mat, symbolizing order, balance, and harmony. It represented the king's power to maintain Mat and ensure universal balance, making it a potent symbol of royal authority and divinity. Depicted in Egyptian art and remaining a popular image in modern times, the Eye of Horus continues to capture the imagination of people worldwide, whether used as a protective amulet, a mathematical tool, or a symbol of divinity, it remains an enduring representation of Egypt's rich cultural heritage. In conclusion, the Eye of Horus is a complex and powerful symbol, representing protection, healing, regeneration, wholeness, order, balance, and royal authority, playing a prominent role in the mythology, religion, and culture of ancient Egypt. Horus, often hailed as the Lord of the Sky, embodies the colors of Egypt's three crowns, blue reflecting the sky. Additionally, his green skin symbolizes fertility, agriculture, rebirth, life, and resurrection. This symbolism, embedded in the ancient religion, has endured over millennia, with the Egyptian trinity of Osiris, Isis, and Horus retaining its significance despite changing names. In the ancient Babylonian tale, Nimrod and Sarah Maris ruled as the majestic king and queen of Babylon. Tammuz, their son, was more than just a mere offspring. He was believed to be a reincarnation of Nimrod himself. The narrative takes different twists, with some versions recounting Tammuz's demise at the tusks of a wild boar, while others describe his dismemberment, with his parts scattered across the world. Samaramus, in her quest, manages to gather all the pieces, except for Tammuz's male organ. This curious absence sparks Samaramus to construct an obelisk, a monument that takes on a symbolic representation of a phallus. The enduring presence of this symbol can be observed in various locations, such as Washington, D.C., where the Washington Monument proudly stands. London boasts Cleopatra's Needle as another embodiment of this ancient tale, while even Rome holds an obelisk transported from Egypt by Caligula in 37 AD. Interestingly, parallels emerge between this Babylonian myth and the Christian trinity. The triad of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in Christianity echoes the ancient narrative of Nimrod, Tammuz, and the symbolic journey of his parts gathered by Samaramus. Osiris, a prominent figure in ancient Egyptian mythology, endured a captivating tale of dismemberment, entwined with celestial rhythms and symbolic significance. The complex narrative of Osiris eclipses others, like the Cyrus myth, in both elaboration and influence. This remarkable story unfolds within a sacred temple, where the moon's celestial dance takes center stage. The temple serves as a celestial observatory, marking the rhythmic changes of the moon and commemorating its various phases. Osiris, the focal character, embodies a 28-year life mirroring the lunar cycle. 
His dismemberment into 14 pieces aligns with the 14 days encompassing the decline from the full moon to the new moon. Osiris meets his demise under the luminous full moon, ushering in an occult tale steeped in resurrection. Upon restoration, his left lunar eye, named Widjet, meaning Whole One, emerges as a potent symbol of healing, well-being, and protection. Often depicted with a white pupil, this eye stands in stark contrast to its counterpart, symbolizing the morning star, Ra, and the red sun disk, a feature that Horus, eye, inherits. Horus, a key player in the narrative, earns the title of Lord of the Sky, drawing connections to the azure heavens which align with the hues of Egypt's three crowns. These symbolic colors persist through time and are reflected in the national flags of various countries worldwide. Thus, Osiris's myth not only unravels a celestial saga, but also weaves a tale of enduring symbolism that transcends ancient times, echoing through the flags that flutter in the winds of today, a tale of mysterious books. The man who shared the pictures confessed that he couldn't keep hold of the book for long, but he could sense its age. He mentioned struggling to understand at least two different languages or writing styles in it. According to one source, the book seems really ancient. Considering ancient Egypt's fascination with the Eye of Horus as a protective symbol, it would make sense for such a book to exist. The Egyptians used this emblem as a good luck charm, putting it on almost everything they held dear. Now, when it comes to figuring out if this book is the real deal, there's a potential for big money in these discoveries, especially if they end up in markets with no strict rules. It's a bit like a mystery. Could it be genuine? Or is it a modern creation or even a total fake? There's a lot to consider when unraveling the secrets behind this intriguing find. In a separate discovery, a remarkable ancient manuscript named the Book of the Dead was discovered from within an Egyptian tomb. Unlike the spooky tales of the Necronomicon bound in human skin from the Evil Dead films, this ancient Book of the Dead scroll was recently found at Egypt's Saqqara Necropolis, it's not wrapped in human skin, but it still stands as a spine-chilling guide to the afterlife. A team of international researchers, led by the renowned Egyptologist Dr. Zahi Hawass, made this intriguing find at the 4,200-year-old funeral temple of Queen Nierit, who was the wife of Pharaoh Teti. The discovery unveils a new collection of antiquities, shedding light on the mysteries of ancient Egyptian burial practices and the beliefs surrounding the journey to the beyond. Pharaoh Teti, a distinguished ruler of ancient Egypt, emerged onto the historical stage during the tumultuous era of the Sixth Dynasty of the Old Kingdom. Born around 2345 BCE, Teti's ascension to the throne marked a crucial point in the annals of Egyptian history as he embarked on a reign that would leave an indelible mark on the rich history of the ancient world. The shocking origins of Teti shrouded in the mists of time only add to the mystique surrounding this formidable pharaoh. Seizing the throne from Pharaoh Userkare, Teti assumed the title of Seheteptawi, signaling the beginning of an era that would witness both grandeur and challenges. Teti's reign, spanning from 2323 to 2291 BCE, unfolded against the backdrop of the fascinating landscape of ancient Egypt. The Sixth Dynasty, marked by its architectural ingenuity and religious fervor, underwent profound shifts during Teti's rule, foreshadowing the eventual decline of the illustrious Old Kingdom. Inscribed within the ancient stones of Saqqara, Teti's legacy materialized in the form of a monumental pyramid complex that bore witness to the zenith of Egyptian architectural prowess. The Pyramid of Teti, a celestial staircase to the heavens, stood as a symbol of the pharaoh's aspirations for immortality and the profound connection between earthly rulership and the divine realm. Amidst the whispers of the desert winds, Queen Nayarit, Teddy's consort, played a crucial role in this historical drama. Recent excavations at her funerary temple unveiled an awe-inspiring treasure trove, including the cryptic Book of the Dead. This ancient manuscript, an exquisite guide to the afterlife, hinted at the intricate spiritual beliefs that animated the hearts of Teddy's subjects. Yet, as Teddy's reign unfolded like the unfolding petals of a lotus, it faced challenges that mirrored the shifting sands of time. 
the complex dance between political differences and the decentralization of royal authority marked the latter part of his rule, contributing to the ebbing tide of the Old Kingdom's grandeur. In the mosaic of Teddy's historical narrative, gaps in the chronicles only deepen the allure of this epic. Scholars engage in a scholarly ballet, seeking to unravel the mysteries of Teddy's decline, a secret that echoes through the corridors of time. Pharaoh Teddy, in his pursuit of immortality, not only left an indomitable mark on the landscape of ancient Egypt, but also wove a narrative that transcends epochs. His pyramid, a silent sentinel against the relentless march of time, stands as a monument to ambition, religious fervor, and the eternal quest for the divine. As the pages of history unfold, Teti's reign remains a captivating chapter, a story woven with threads of grandeur, challenges, and the timeless echoes of an ancient civilization. Teti's tomb, nestled in the ancient Egyptian Sahara, emerges as a captivating archaeological find from the God Kingdom's Sixth Dynasty. Situated in the expansive burial grounds of Saqqara, this tomb serves as the eternal resting place not only for Teti, but also for several other significant figures etched in the annals of Egyptian history. Distinguished as one of the most renowned and impeccably preserved tombs in Saqqara, this archaeological gem was unearthed by the skilled hands of Italian archaeologist Alessandro Barsanti in 1881. Dating back to around 2300 BCE, a time near the original construction period of the Giza pyramids, Teti's tomb stands apart with its unique features. Unlike the subterranean structures commonly associated with Egyptian tombs, Teti's final abode is above ground, adorned with delicate carvings, hieroglyphics, and depictions that offer glimpses into authentic Egyptian life during the 23rd century BCE. The tomb, characterized by its wealth of carvings and inscriptions, paints a vivid picture of the cultural tapestry of that era. Alessandro Barsanti's discovery has unearthed a treasure trove of information about Teti and his contemporaries. The detailed carvings on the walls provide insights into the daily lives, rituals, and societal nuances of ancient Egyptians, offering a unique lens into their existence. Venturing deeper into the tomb, one encounters a significant feature, the shaft. This shaft, akin to a treasure trove, holds buried treasures that were carefully interred, waiting to be discovered by the intrepid archaeologists. The Acropolis, a sprawling and culturally rich area, teems with artifacts that underscore the complexity of Egyptian life during Teddy's reign. Unraveling the mysteries hidden within this expansive burial ground requires time, patience, and meticulous effort. As the exploration continues, the myriad cultural artifacts unearthed shed light on the rituals, beliefs, and artistic expressions of the ancient Egyptians. Each discovery in Teti's tomb contributes to our understanding of this bygone era, enriching the tapestry of human history. The meticulous exploration of this site promises to reveal more about Teti, his contemporaries, and the vibrant civilization that thrived in the ancient Egyptian Sahara around 2300 BCE. Within this treasure trove, a mystifying collection unfolds, revealing the dynamics of ancient Egyptian life and beliefs. Among the riches lie not just one or two, but over 50 wooden sarcophagi, meticulously crafted vessels that once cradled the departed, adorned with symbols of protection and passage. Each coffin, a symbol of the profound rites of passage, whispers stories of souls embarking on an eternal journey. As if frozen in a moment, a Senate board game emerges from the sands. Carved wooden pieces await their next move on the ancient board, inviting us to envision the strategic and leisurely pursuits of those who reveled in the sacred grounds. The Senate game, a bridge between the earthly and the spiritual, beckons us to partake in the mysteries of the past. A riverboat, artfully sculpted, stands as proof that the ancient Egyptians traveled across the cosmic waters. Wooden rowers are forever poised in motion, symbolizing the perpetual journey of the departed. It's a touching reminder of the river's role as a conduit, ferrying souls toward the embrace of Osiris, an eternal voyage through celestial realms. 
A watchful deity, the statue of Ptah Sokar Osiris, stands sentinel among the treasures. A synthesis of Ptah, Sokar, and Osiris, this divine figure embodies the transformative journey from creation to death and rebirth. The statue's presence adds a spiritual dimension to the trove, invoking the ancient beliefs that surrounded the mystical passage into the next realm. Within the collection of artifacts, peculiar wooden masks come to light, capturing the countenances of individuals who once traversed the hallowed pathways of the afterlife. Meticulously fashioned and embellished with symbols, these masks assumed the role of sentinels, safeguarding a soul's secure traversal through the cosmic courtyard that lies beyond. A shrine dedicated to Anubis, the jackal-headed deity, unfolds as a sacred testimony, revealing the enigmatic practices of mummification and the ethereal odyssey that awaited the departed. Anubis, the benevolent guide for those journeying into the realms beyond, presided over rituals meticulously designed to conserve and shield the soul during its celestial pilgrimage. The intricacies of these practices add a layer of mystique to the ancient rites, offering glimpses into the profound beliefs surrounding the transition from mortal existence to the transcendental spheres. A burial sanctuary, dedicated to an old kingdom queen, rises in symbolism of the regal reverence of ancient times. This sanctuary, a harmonious blend of artistry and spirituality, symbolizes the eternal connection between earthly royalty and the divine. At the heart of this remarkable discovery lies the crown jewel, a 13-foot-long Book of the Dead papyrus scroll, a sacred manuscript intricately illustrated unfurling the cosmic paths traversed by departed souls through the netherworlds. Each hieroglyphic stroke breathes life into the afterlife, providing a captivating roadmap for the soul's journey into the timeless realms beyond. In the dance of shadows within this burial chamber, these artifacts collectively narrate tales of an ancient civilization's beliefs, aspirations, and the delicate dance between life and the afterlife. Each piece, carefully preserved by time, becomes a portal through which we, too, can glimpse the mysteries that captivated the hearts and minds of those who once walked the hallowed grounds of ancient Egypt. In their remarkable expedition, Dr. Hawass and his team unearthed an array of coffins and ancient treasures that trace their origins back to the illustrious New Kingdom era, spanning from 1550 to 1070 BC. The discoveries unfolded within an intricate network of 52 distinct burial tunnels, plunging to depths ranging from 33 to 40 feet beneath the desert sands. These findings provide a captivating glimpse into the rich taste of the past, shedding light on the rituals and legacies that echo through the millennia. During the New Kingdom spanning from the 18th to the 20th dynasties, approximately 1552 to 1070 BCE, a transformative chapter unfolded in the tapestry of ancient Egypt's history. Around 1580 BCE, the Egyptian princes of Thebes successfully ousted the Hyksos, liberating the nation and initiating the Empire Age. This era marked a reunification, with pharaohs consciously reviving the artistic traditions reminiscent of the early 12th dynasty. For nearly 500 years, Egypt flourished through victorious wars, including the campaigns led by Thutmose III and Ramses II. The country experienced unparalleled prosperity and a construction boom, leaving an enduring legacy in the form of stone temples and rock-cut tombs that still stand today. Unveiling the Imperial Triumphs In the 18th dynasty, from 1550 to 1307 BCE, Egypt's reach extended far beyond its borders. The victorious military campaigns of Thebes' rulers reached from Palestine and parts of Syria to the Euphrates and Orantes rivers. With the empire stretching south to the Fourth Cataract, some 500 miles south of Aswan, notable rulers such as Amenhotep III played significant roles in these military endeavors. However, during the reign of Hatshepsut, a shift occurred. As the wife and half-sister of Thutmose II, she assumed the role of regent during her nephew Thutmose III's minority. Unsatisfied with a regent's role, 
Hatshepsut declared herself pharaoh and focused on internal development rather than military expansion. Later, Thutmose III resumed military policies, contributing to Egypt's wealth. As Egypt thrived, the priesthood's power, particularly at the Karnak Temple, began to rival that of the royal house. Amenhotep and his grandson, Amenhotep III, significantly increased the priesthood's influence through donations from military conquests. However, this growing power began to interfere with the royal house's activities. In response, Amenhotep III enacted cultural changes challenging the divinity of the king. His son, Akhenaten, and Queen Nefertiti expanded upon these ideas, limiting the priesthood's power. Akhenaten established a new monotheistic faith, appointing himself as the sole high priest, with the physical sun disk as the symbol of worship. This marked a period of newfound freedom from old traditions in art, sculpture, architecture, and literature. However, this radical shift lasted only about 20 years. The new town of Akhetaten was abandoned, and under the reign of Tutankhamun, Egypt returned to polytheistic practices. The names of Akhenaten and his monotheistic faith were obliterated, and the old deities were restored to their former state. As dynasties changed, military leaders rose to power. Horemheb, Seti I, and Ramses II led Egyptian armies to consolidate the weakened empire, threatened by the Hittites. Ramses II's reign, lasting 67 years, saw prolific monument building, surpassing any other pharaoh. The subsequent rulers faced economic difficulties, tomb robberies, strikes, and political setbacks. Around 1185 BCE, Egypt faced a significant threat from the Sea Peoples, but Merneptah and Ramses III successfully repelled them. Despite setbacks, this period helped Egypt regain some of its former glory. However, economic challenges persisted, leading to inflation, famine, and administrative scandals. In the end, the new kingdom succumbed to crisis, with the country splitting into two lands. The south, ruled by the high priests of Amun in Thebes, and the north, a dynasty of wheat kings at Tanis in the eastern delta. Despite the challenges, the new kingdom left an indelible mark on Egyptian history, shaping its cultural, military, and economic landscape for centuries to come. According to an official statement from Egypt's Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, a remarkable discovery has been made, revealing coffins and a variety of ancient artifacts dating back to the New Kingdom era. What sets these coffins apart is their distinguished nature, as they belong to the nobles of ancient Egypt. This finding raises intriguing questions. What are the identities of these individuals, and what implications do such discoveries have for present-day Egyptians? Join us as we unravel the mysteries behind the discovered coffins, unveiling the funerary temple. In the former capital of Egypt, the ancient city of Memphis, the diligent efforts of archaeologists have unveiled extensive burial grounds. This significant revelation comes after multiple seasons of excavation in the vicinity of the funeral temple devoted to Queen Neret, which encircles the pyramid of King Teti, the founding ruler of the dynasty. Adding to the thrill is the uncovering of a remarkable collection of sarcophagi, elegantly adorned with depictions of ancient gods and fragments from the revered Book of the Dead. This spiritual guide was thought to guide the departed on their journey to Aru, the celestial paradise ruled by Osiris. The murals adorning these sarcophagi not only display the artistic brilliance of the time, but also provide a fascinating insight into the spiritual beliefs and rituals associated with the afterlife in ancient Egypt. Egyptian archaeologists joyfully revealed the discovery of Queen Nierit's funerary temple, the beloved wife of King Teti. Portions of this remarkable site had already been uncovered in preceding years. The diligent Egyptian mission, operating in the Saqqara archaeological site adjacent to the pyramid of King Teti, the inaugural pharaoh of the Sixth Dynasty in the Old Kingdom, unveiled a series of compelling archaeological findings spanning the Old and New Kingdoms. Guided by the esteemed Zahi Hawass, the mission collaborated with the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities and Bibliotheca Alexandrina. These shocking discoveries promised to rewrite the historical narrative of the region, 
particularly during the 18th and 19th dynasties of the New Kingdom, an era when Pharaoh Teti held divine reverence. The mission uncovered compelling evidence of additional burials surrounding Teti's pyramid, emphasizing that the entry to the Saqqara area in the New Kingdom originated from this site. A notable revelation included unraveling the layout of Queen Neret's temple, housing her tomb, along with the discovery of three mud-brick warehouses adjoining the temple's southeastern side. These storage spaces were ingeniously designed to house temple provisions, offerings, and tools utilized in the queen's tomb. One of the most captivating finds involved the disclosure of 52 burial shafts plunging to depths of 10 to 12 meters. These shafts harbored hundreds of wooden coffins dating back to the New Kingdom, marking the first instance of such coffins, crafted three millennia ago, discovered in the Saqqara region. These anthropoid wooden coffins portrayed scenes of revered gods from that period and showcased excerpts from the Book of the Dead, aiding the departed on their journey to the afterlife. This fascinating discovery firmly establishes that Saqqara served as a burial site, not only during the late period, but also throughout the New Kingdom. The mission achieved a remarkable feat by uncovering an additional trove of anthropoid wooden coffins. Nestled within this shaft were 50 coffins, all remarkably well-preserved. Astonishing artifacts rewriting ancient history. In the course of their exploration, the team also revealed an astonishing underground mud-brick shrine hailing from the New Kingdom, hidden 24 meters beneath the ground's surface. The unique aspect of this find is the open court of the shaft, the first of its kind in terms of depth. The court boasted a floor adorned with impeccably polished and gleaming limestone slabs. While ongoing work is underway in the shaft, Zahi Hawass is optimistic that it will remain untouched by thieves. This discovery stands among the most significant findings in the region, shedding light on the existence of workshops responsible for crafting these coffins eagerly acquired by locals, as well as workshops dedicated to mummification. Within the depths of the shafts, the mission stumbled upon a wealth of archaeological treasures and statues portraying revered deities like Osiris and Ta Soker, Osiris. Notably, a four-meter-long papyrus surfaced, showcasing Chapter 17 from the Book of the Dead. This extraordinary find has been linked to Pu Ka F, a name that resonates across four Shabti statues and an anthropoid wooden coffin. The New Kingdom also yielded a collection of exquisite Shabti statues crafted from wood, stone, and faience, adding a layer of beauty and historical significance to this freezing discovery. The mission made another stunning find, numerous wooden funerary masks, and an exclusive shrine dedicated to Anubis, the guardian of the cemetery, statues of the god, and an array of games belonging to the departed for their afterlife, amusement, were also among the discoveries. Within this trove of artifacts, depictions of birds like geese and an impressive bronze axe hinted at the military prowess of an individual, likely an army leader during the New Kingdom. A particularly captivating discovery was a remarkably preserved limestone stela belonging to a couple, Kapta and Mordemwia. The upper part of the stela showcased the couple in an adoration gesture before Osiris, with the lower part portraying the deceased sitting and his wife seated on a chair. Beneath her chair, one of their daughters was depicted smelling a lotus flower with an ointment flask positioned above her head. What adds a layer of fascination to the stela is the daughter named Nefertari, in homage to the beloved wife of King Ramses II, known for her marvelous tomb in the Valley of the Queens and a temple at Abu Simbel. Another son, Ka'em Wasit, shared a namesake with one of Pharaoh Ramses II's sons, recognized as a wise man and the first Egyptologist who restored ancestral antiquities. Kapta, the stela's owner, held the prestigious title of overseer of the king's military chariot during the 19th dynasty, highlighting his esteemed position. The mission further uncovered substantial quantities of pottery dating back to the New Kingdom, offering insights into the commercial ties between Egypt and regions such as Crete, Syria, and Palestine. Further studies by Sahar Salim, a radiology professor, and Afaf, 
a bone-specialized archaeologist, revealed intriguing details about the mummies. Causes of death, age determination, and the presence of chronic diseases, like Mediterranean fever, were unveiled through Mediculus examinations. Hawass emphatically declares this discovery as the most significant archaeological find of the year, poised to transform Saqqara into a prominent tourist and cultural destination. Beyond that, it promises to rewrite the history of Saqqara during the New Kingdom, underscoring the enduring significance of the worship of King Teti during the 19th dynasty. The Afterlife Adventure Delving into the depths of this remarkable discovery, we find a colossal 13-foot-long papyrus that unfolds the mysteries of the afterlife through chapter 17 of the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead is an ancient Egyptian guide to navigating the realms beyond. This sacred scroll, a captivating relic, bears the name Pu Kaif, the individual to whom this spiritual manual belonged. But the intrigue doesn't stop there. The same name adorns not just the papyrus but also a wooden coffin and a quartet of shapti figurines, intricately crafted to accompany and serve the departed in the beyond. It's as if these artifacts, with shared ownership by Pukav, whisper tales of a bygone era, weaving a narrative that transcends the boundaries between the living and the eternal. In the mystical realm of ancient Egypt, the journey beyond death was an extraordinary adventure. According to their captivating beliefs, the departed soul embarked on a voyage to the Duat, or underworld. Success in this airy journey depended on navigating the Hall of Truth, where the heart faced judgment against the white feather of Mayat, overseen by Osiris and 42 judges. The soul, having crossed the Hall of Truth, glides across Lily Lake, also known as the Lake of Flowers, guided by a mysterious boatman. The gateway to the afterlife, the field of reeds, unfolded as a mirror image of earthly life. There, amidst the eternal splendors, reunions with loved ones, and the delights of earthly joys awaited. A celestial haven brimming with feasts, laughter, and contentment. In this otherworldly continuum, community bonds remained paramount. Even in paradise, labor was esteemed. Yet an intriguing twist awaited. Instead of a substitute for communal duties, a Shabti doll could seamlessly assume your role. These strange figures, known as the Answerers, accompanied the departed, armed with a spell inscribed upon them to fulfill assigned tasks in the afterlife. The crafting of Shabti dolls unfolded as a sacred art. Each delicately carved figure bespoke a specific task adorned with farming tools, baskets, hoes, or chisels. Shabti dolls emerged as guardians of the soul's earthly identity, offering a glimpse into the diversity of tasks awaiting in the afterlife. The number of Shabti dolls became an emblem of status and wealth, an ancient proof of the individual's celestial standing. Shabti dolls were commonly discovered in the burial sites of Egyptian nobles, such as pharaohs and their queens. As the sands of time unfolded, the Shabti dolls were transformed. In the Third Intermediate Period, overseer Shabti dolls, wielding whips, hinted at a hierarchical shift. Yet, like a cosmic dance, they returned to their primal role as diligent workers for the deceased in later periods in history. In this fascinating cosmic dance, the number of Shabti dolls became the universal currency. The more one was entombed with, the less labor and more leisure awaited in the eternal embrace of the field of reeds. Equality and death prevailed, echoing the earthly status of the departed. In the alluring drama of ancient Egypt, the fate of the afterlife was woven with spells, shabti dolls, and the eternal allure of the field of reeds. Deep within a lavishly adorned tomb in Middle Egypt, archaeologists have stumbled upon a captivating relic, the oldest known copy of what seems to be the world's first illustrated book. This extraordinary find is a 4,000-year-old edition of the Book of Two Ways, an ancient Egyptian guide believed to be the older version of the more familiar Book of the Dead. What lies in the weathered pages of this ancient book, and what does it hold for us? 
Join us as we unravel the mysterious Book of Two Ways, origins of the Book of Two Ways. Believed to be an early version leading to the creation of the Book of the Dead, this text, predating its known predecessors by nearly half a century, was discovered on the remnants of a Middle Kingdom coffin belonging to a previously unknown royal lady named Ankh. However, the question arises, is this truly the oldest rendition of the Book of Two Ways? For those unfamiliar with the strange realms of ancient Egyptian culture, the Book of the Dead is infamous. It stands as an ancient Egyptian compendium of mortuary texts, a compilation of spells and magical formulas carefully placed in tombs. These mystical incantations were believed to safeguard and assist the departed in the afterlife. Compiled and re-edited during the 16th century BC, the collection includes coffin texts from around 2000 BC, pyramid texts dating back to 2400 BC, and other inscriptions. Scribes meticulously copied these texts onto scrolls of papyrus, often embellished with vibrant illustrations, selling them to affluent individuals for burial purposes. Despite numerous discoveries in Egyptian tombs, no single copy contains approximately 200 known chapters. Originally known as The Chambers of Coming Forth by Day, the collection earned its modern name from Carl Richard Lepsius, the German Egyptologist who published the first compilation in 1842. Deir el Bersha, situated in Middle Egypt near the Nile, holds significance as an isolated Coptic village. About 140 miles south of Cairo, it is east of the River Nile and home to an essential necropolis established during the Middle Kingdom. This necropolis includes over 39 tombs of governors, known as Narks, with the tomb of Dudi being a notable one. These governors resided in Hermopolis, an important provincial capital city located near the boundary between Lower and Upper Egypt. Hermopolis, a city devoted to Thoth, the god of learning and patron of scribes, had its main cemetery on the cliffs of Deir el Bersha. The early excavations at this site unveiled high-status burials, particularly that of Dudi, whose title was the Great Overlord of the Hare Province. Dudi's elaborately adorned tomb showcases a unique scene depicting the transportation of a massive statue from the alabaster quarries at Hanub to his mortuary chapel. This scene serves as a rich source of information about the ancient Egyptians' techniques for moving colossal statues and stone blocks. In a vivid portrayal captured on ancient canvas, we witness the monumental feat of transporting a colossal 21-foot-high, 60-ton statue. The scene unfolds as 172 men laboriously pull the statue atop a wooden sled, guided by ropes, while another individual strategically pours water onto the ground ahead of the sled perhaps a clever tactic to facilitate the movement of this massive object. Further enhancing the spectacle, the artwork illustrates the intricate process of hoisting the statue into its elevated position through the strategic use of wooden levers. Fast forward to September 2019. A momentous chapter in archaeological revelation unfolds with an article penned by Professor Harko Williams from the University of Leuven in Belgium. Published in the esteemed Journal of Egyptian Archaeology, the article unveils an extraordinary find, an ancient tomb within the Deir el Bersha necropolis, initially discovered in 2012 by Professor Williams's research team. This tomb belonged to Ak, a veterinarian priest and local governor. In an accidental discovery, approximately 20 feet below the burial shaft, archaeologists encountered the impeccably preserved sarcophagus of Ankh, an aristocratic woman previously unknown to history but closely linked to a prominent government official. Despite the inevitable ravages of time on the cedarwood coffin, a meticulous examination bore fruit, revealing a treasure trove within. The inner planks of the sarcophagus bore intricate carvings, inscriptions, and paintings, a visual narrative intricately woven to illustrate segments of an ancient manuscript known as the Book of Two Ways. Dating back to the reign of Pharaoh Mentuhotep II, around 2110 BC, this remarkable discovery now stands as the oldest known copy of this ancient text. The Book of Two Ways, with its mystical guidance, was meticulously crafted to accompany Ankh on her journey into the afterlife. 
This revelation not only provides a tangible link to the beliefs and practices of ancient Egyptians, but also unveils a captivating chapter in the intricate tapestry of their cultural and spiritual heritage. The ancient manuscript in question is titled The Book of Two Ways, a name bestowed upon it due to its role as a guide, offering explicit instructions on the journey to Rostau, the domain of Osiris. What makes this guide intriguing is its comprehensive advice on navigating this afterlife realm, whether by land or water. In a fascinating twist, despite originally housing the remains of Ankh, a woman, the text consistently refers to her as he. This peculiarity finds its roots in Egyptian mythology, where the concept of rebirth was predominantly associated with male deities. In this cultural framework, deceased women were symbolically transformed into male entities, aligning with the archetype of Osiris, the god synonymous with death and rebirth. Professor Williams sheds light on the curious notion of how survival in the netherworld is portrayed using male terms. These coffin texts often intricately place the departed within the realm of the gods, occasionally complemented by vivid illustrations. Within the dear Albertia necropolis, encounters with the Book of Two Ways are not uncommon, showcasing a captivating aspect. Each individual had a personalized version tailored to their specific status and wealth. Ankh's personalized guide to the underworld incorporates potent spells strategically designed to ward off demons encountered during her journey. The text vividly warns of the arduous path to Rostau, fraught with challenges in the form of fire demons and spirits, demanding resilience and determination to overcome. Professor Williams highlights the textual beginning, encircled by a distinctive red line denoted as the Ring of Fire, symbolizing the protective barrier that the Sun God must traverse to reach Osiris. The archaeological expedition further unveiled 24 additional surviving texts of the Book of Two Ways within the burial shaft. Regrettably, the ravages of time have considerably faded the text and illustrations, rendering them challenging to decipher. Despite the fading, experts surmise that these images likely depict rituals aimed at rejuvenating deceased gods or humans symbolizing the profound concept of rebirth deeply ingrained in Egyptian culture. The Mysterious Journey to Osiris In the remarkable tomb of Kesawer, a high-ranking official from the Middle Kingdom from 2055 to 1650 BCE, archaeologists stumbled upon the extraordinary find, the Book of Two Ways. As their exploration continued into other tombs, they uncovered similar texts, revealing that this book held profound importance in Egyptian burial practices during that era. This mystical guide, similar to other funerary texts, aimed to be a compass for the departed, offering instructions, spells, and rituals to navigate the highly dangerous journey through the underworld. The ultimate destination, Osiris, the god of the afterlife, and the promise of eternal bliss. Osiris, a central character in the rich scene of Egyptian mythology, originally held great reverence as a powerful deity in the Fifth Dynasty. As the sands of time drifted, the perception of Osiris transformed, casting him in the gentle light of a merciful god. Artistic representations began to depict him as a figure with either green or black skin, donning a pharaoh's beard and swathed in mummy linen. Notably, he wore a unique headdress known as the Atef. A crown adorned with a towering conical structure in pristine white, hailing from Lower Egypt. Completing this distinctive ensemble were the elegant plumes of ram's horns, gracefully framing Osiris's divine countenance. True to its name, the Book of Two Ways outlined two distinct routes in the afterlife. The Celestial Nile, a water route, and a dangerous desert landscape, the Land Route. Both paths were rife with challenges from hostile spirits to supernatural creatures. Overcoming these obstacles required the deceased to possess knowledge, a pearl of wisdom granted by the book, including the names of deities, guardians, spells, and rituals. Guided by this ancient wisdom, the deceased could successfully navigate the afterlife, facing a final trial in the Hall of Judgment before Osiris. 
Here, their heart underwent scrutiny against the Feather of Maat, the goddess of truth and justice. If found lighter than the Feather, the reward was eternal life in the idyllic field of reeds, a paradise where reunions with loved ones awaited. The Book of Two Ways exerted a profound influence on subsequent Egyptian funerary texts, like the Coffin Texts and the Book of the Dead, leaving an enduring legacy that shaped the spiritual narratives of generations to come. The Mystery of Coffin Texts Spanning from the First Intermediate Period to the Middle Kingdom, approximately 2100 to 1182 BCE, the coffin texts emerged as a fascinating glimpse into ancient Egyptian beliefs about the afterlife. These mystical spells, numbering around 1200, were predominantly inscribed on the insides of coffins belonging to esteemed individuals, including high-ranking figures and wealthy private citizens. Contrary to exclusive beliefs, the coffin texts conveyed a universal message, the prospect of an afterlife for everyone. While some spells originated from earlier pyramid texts, the coffin texts introduced fresh content, addressing more commonplace issues and individual desires. These texts were not merely words, they were accompanied by captivating illustrations that enriched the narrative. Embarking on the mystical odyssey of the afterlife, the ancient Egyptians envisioned a duality encompassing celestial heights and earthly realms, where the destiny of the departed is intricately intertwined with the god Osiris and the mysterious netherworld. This profound exploration into the spiritual dimensions persisted through the ages, echoing in the revered coffin texts, which transcended temporal boundaries, lingering in significance even as late as the 27th dynasty. Delving into the esoteric verses of Spell 790 within the Coffin Texts offers a captivating glimpse into the metaphysical utterances of the departed, symbolically represented by the strange placeholder N. Within these sacred words, a profound communion with Osiris unfolds, the god presiding over the realm beyond mortality. The speaker, assuming the symbolic mantle, solemnly pledges allegiance to shield Osiris from the malevolent forces embodied by Seth. This cosmic oath not only signifies devotion, but also reflects an assertion of divine authority. The narrative takes a compelling turn as the speaker lays claim to the extraordinary ability to carve pathways through the cosmic tapestry. With confidence resonating through the spiritual verses, the speaker asserts dominion over the realms above, below, and on earthly grounds. This symbolic journey into the expansive horizon becomes a testament to the spiritual adeptness of the departed, armed with the ethereal prowess to navigate the celestial, terrestrial, and netherworld domains. Diving into the profound depths of the mystical incantation known as Spell 790, we embark on an enlightening journey that peels back the layers of ancient Egyptian cosmology. Each line of this sacred verse unravels the complexities of a worldview steeped in spiritual richness and an intricate tapestry of beliefs. The coffin texts, often misconstrued as mere funerary inscriptions, unveil themselves as more than mere markings on the sepulchral canvas. They emerge as a sacred conduit, a fascinating channel that allows the departed to articulate the nuances of their spiritual sojourn into the afterlife specifically in communion with the divine deity Osiris. It transcends the mundane perception of burial rites, evolving into a profound expression of the soul's voyage beyond the threshold of mortality. Far from being confined to a specific era or dynasty, the coffin texts persist across the histories, their endurance echoing through the corridors of time. This persistence not only highlights their longevity, but also accentuates their enduring significance. These ancient texts become a binding thread that weaves a timeless connection between the realm of the living and the divine domains, creating an unbroken continuum of spiritual exploration. Within the sacred verses of Spell 790, we witness the emergence of a cosmic symphony, a harmonious interplay of words resonating with the echoes of an ancient faith. Each uttered syllable becomes a note in this celestial melody, weaving a narrative that transcends the earthly bounds. It is a symphony that not only underscores the intricate beliefs of the ancient Egyptians, but also serves as a testament to their unwavering conviction in the transcendence of the soul.
As we delve into the essence of Spell 790, we find ourselves immersed in the ancient echoes of a civilization that sought to bridge the mortal and immortal realms. The words, carefully inscribed, carry the weight of centuries, and in their resonance, we discover a profound connection to the enduring mysteries of the human spirit. Thus, in the cosmic dance of Spell 790, we find a timeless expression of faith, a melody that reverberates through the annals of history, inviting us to unravel the mysteries of existence and transcendence. As translated by Faulkner, these ancient utterances echo the enduring belief in the potency of words to navigate the complex realms of the afterlife. As the departed embarked on their journey, they traveled through a mysterious and treacherous region where the body of Osiris rested, surrounded by walls of flame. If the departed proved themselves worthy, they could be granted a new existence in a heavenly place known as the Field of Offerings. Beyond just recounting stories, the coffin texts also shed light on significant events in the Egyptian creation narrative and provide insights into how Egyptians perceived the end of the world. Building upon the ideas presented in the Book of Two Ways, these subsequent texts went further, delving deeper into the themes and concepts introduced. They crafted an even more detailed guide to the afterlife, enriching it with additional spells, prayers, and rituals. This extended exploration aimed to offer a more comprehensive understanding of the spiritual journey beyond, weaving a tapestry of mystical insights and practices. The Egyptian Book of the Dead, or its more accurate translations like The Book of the Coming Forth by Day or Spells by Going Forth by Day, stands as a captivating compendium of ancient spells. The spells are meticulously crafted to guide a departed soul through the intricate realms of the afterlife. Its ultimate destination for the soul was the Field of Reeds, a paradisiacal haven akin to earthly life's continuation. Within the enchanted verses of these spells lies a detailed roadmap for the departed, offering profound insights into the post humus journey. It serves as a manual, an indispensable guide that imparts the knowledge needed for navigating the afterlife successfully. The spells within this ancient guide provide crucial information on where to go, how to address specific gods, what words to utter in various circumstances, and, most importantly, the secrets to reaching the revered field of reeds. Considered highly valuable, having a set of spells explaining such crucial information was deemed an invaluable asset by the ancient Egyptians. As early as the Third Dynasty, around 2670 to 2613 BCE, religious texts made their appearance on sarcophagi and pyramid walls known as the Pyramid Texts. Initially exclusive to royal burials, these texts comprised spells and incantations geared towards elevating the soul of the king to the heavens. Between approximately 2400 and 2300 BCE, texts on coffins emerged, drawing inspiration from the earlier pyramid texts. These texts aim to assist the departed in navigating the afterlife. The transition from the Old Kingdom to the First Intermediate Period and the Early Middle Kingdom marked a significant shift. While initially, only the king was assured of an afterlife during the Old Kingdom, the advent of the coffin texts in the First Intermediate Period expanded this belief to include ordinary individuals, suggesting they too were deemed worthy of eternal life. By the New Kingdom, approximately between 1570 and 1069 BCE, the coffin texts evolved into a more comprehensive guide known as the Book of the Dead. Inspired by earlier texts from coffins and pyramid tombs, this sophisticated compilation continued to provide spells and accompanying illustrations. As early as the 12th dynasty, around 1991 to 1802 BCE, these spells found a new home on papyrus scrolls, carefully placed with the departed in their tombs to serve as a timeless passport to the mysteries of the afterlife. The pyramid texts, a collection of ancient spells and rituals, were primarily used during the later Old Kingdom and the First Intermediate Period, spanning from around 2380 to 2025 BCE. With over 800 known spells, these texts were inscribed on the inner walls of Pharaoh's pyramids and, to a lesser extent, those of queens. One of the main purposes of the pyramid texts was to ensure that the deceased pharaoh or queen could join their ancestors among the gods and the everlasting stars in the sky. 
The afterlife, as envisioned in these texts, is predominantly situated in heaven. Unlike later periods in the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom, where dangers from demons were frequently mentioned. The pyramid texts focus on tangible aspects like preserving one's name and ensuring a continuous supply of food. Even after the Old Kingdom, the pyramid texts remained a distinct collection and were still used to inscribe coffins during the Middle Kingdom. Individual spells from the pyramid texts continued to be employed until the late period, which concluded in 332 BCE when Alexander the Great conquered Egypt. An example from the pyramid texts, Uttaransa 245 in the Unas Pyramid, specifically belongs to the commendation to the sky. In this utterance, Unas is described as having left his earthly father and Horus behind. Growing wings like a falcon, and feathers like a hawk. The text emphasizes Eunice's journey to join the stars in the sky, depicting him as the lone star at Nut's shoulder. This celestial ascent is captured in the translation by Alan, highlighting the magical and transformative nature of the pyramid texts. Ancient Egyptian society held the Book of Two Ways in high regard, emphasizing their deep focus on the afterlife and the everlasting yearning for eternal existence. This text serves as a window into the intricate and complex belief system that profoundly influenced the lives of the Egyptians. Central to its teachings is the importance of proper burial practices and the transformative power of knowledge, crucial for a successful journey through the afterlife. Beyond being a mere textual guide, the Book of Two Ways is adorned with vivid and detailed illustrations. These captivating images portray various scenes from the journey through the afterlife, showcasing encounters with deities, spirits, and the landscapes crossed by the deceased. The illustrations act as visual aids, reinforcing the messages conveyed by the text and providing an immersive experience for the reader. In the modern era, scholars continue to delve into the Book of Two Ways, extracting invaluable insights into the beliefs and practices of ancient Egyptians. Through translations and analysis, researchers pieced together the complex cosmology and religious beliefs that shaped this ancient civilization. This ongoing exploration enriches our understanding of their society and culture. As proof of the rich cultural and religious heritage of ancient Egypt, the Book of Two Ways leaves an enduring legacy. Its fascination and reverence persist among both scholars and the general public. With each revelation from this captivating text, we gain a deeper appreciation for the ancient Egyptians' views on the cosmos, the afterlife, and the human yearning for eternal existence. As we conclude our journey through the Book of Two Ways, we are reminded of the intricacies of ancient Egyptian cosmology and the fascinating beliefs that molded their understanding of the afterlife. The book continues to provide a captivating window into the world of the ancient Egyptians, captivating us with the mysteries it holds. What aspect of this fascinating discovery thrilled you most? Leave your comment below.